Morning, up, Cliff. How's everybody doing today? Well, I'm excited to be at church today. There a few weeks ago, uh, me and Tiffany were both working a whole lot, and uh, last week we both, it was funny, I'll tell you a quick story before I get into this real quick, but uh, we was going on vacation last Sunday, and Saturday, I believe it was, I had it on my heart, I was like, well, let's go to church and then travel. But I didn't say anything, and I got home, and Tiffany goes, what do you think about going to church and then traveling? And so, you know, see how God worked, you know, and how, and my, my, my topic today, real quick on the intro, is just passion. Uh, as I have observed God moving in both of our lives, in, in Tiffany's life and my life, and I, and I observe people, and you can tell people who have a passion for whatever it is they're involved in, a passion for God, Will give you, will take you places you've never dreamed of, and and and, I, and this morning, you know, and I've been studying about this, thinking about this. I was working out yesterday, you know, and and they, I keep scratching, and scribbling notes on papers, and some of them I forget and leave there. Uh, maybe that's on purpose. I don't know. Subconsciously, somebody else come in and look at it or whatever. And uh, but all week I've been working, so I go, what what do I need to go with? And this morning I got to thinking about Tom Brady. And, and his passion for football. And, and, and I'm going to read some of this uh, because God just gave me all this this morning. I was actually laying. Amber, I had gotten up at like 4 o'clock and come and laid down in bed with us, you know, and she was like petting me on the face and uh, I think elbow dropping Tiffany and, you know. Uh, but so, so I'm up and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I start texting this stuff, you know, and, and my phone is... It's decrepit, broke, and everything. So, and I'm a horrible texter. So I'm just here trying to put all this together. And then I went into the living room, and and this is what the Lord gave me. It's just this morning. It's like, have you ever watched Tom Brady play? How he plays football? And that's the debate. He may come back, and he may not. You know. And I'm a Tom Brady fan. Believe me, I love watching a guy because of his passion and his fire. And so there is a reason he became the standard for success in the game. He played with fire, passion, persistence, and an unparalleled dedication to his craft. He, he, he's been, he was molded to be a quarterback. I mean, that, that's just not just his natural ability. He took that natural ability and applied it and trained and studied the game. But he gave his all to a game that has so far as it seems. And, and I, don't get me wrong, I don't want you to think that I'm judging Tom Brady because I don't know all the ins and outs, but I do know that he, when he came back, you know, I'm sure that he was looking forward, him and his wife was looking forward to family time together. But he gave his all to a game that has, so far as it seems, has made a wreck of his personal life and the life of his family, you know. And I'm just looking at this from the outside. I don't know all the details. Uh, he gave his all to the game. Uh, uh, that man, as earthly great as he is, desperately needs Jesus, as we all do. And, and what I'm talking about is misplaced passion initially. It says, while properly placed passion can be a good thing, even a great thing, misplaced passion can lead to the undoing of our lives. Misplaced passion, priorities, plans, and purposes will lead you to an empty and an unfulfilled life. So I'm just sitting here, and God's given me to this as quick as I can type it out with two thumbs. Even worse, it can lead you to destruction, despair, and ruin. Not only that, but it can spread to those around you as well. I preach this at the jail all the time. I was like, you can be a conduit of blessing or you can be a conduit of destruction. It's whatever you're plugged into that everybody else is going to receive from you. But recently, PJ preached a message on how our choices can impact lives for generations to come. The choices that Abraham made and Moses made and people who are in situation, a forks of the road situation, the choice you make, whether you're going to stay in your marriage or whether you're going to give it up. Whether you're going to stay in a job or whether you're going to swap jobs. We all face choices every day. That is what the enemy of our souls wants for us. He wants to hijack our lives so He can lead us as well as everyone around us to destruction, death, and ultimately hell followed by the eternal lake of fire. You've got to understand the end game. I, I, I don't mince words because it is that serious. And I know this is just an opening up and I'm going to move along fast, but this is going to end up being a few messages, I believe, that I'm going to take down to the jail. Satan wants to take you out and everyone he can reach through you 
That is what misplaced passion can do. It can and will destroy everything within its reach. Make no mistake, He wants to touch you and all the people He can with destruction through you. The gates of hell can be opened through you. And I, that thought hit me this morning. The thought hit me. The gates of hell can be opened through you and the gates of blessing can be opened. The gates to God can be opened through you. Even Paul, I believe, said, follow me as I follow Christ. Your life choices can impact not only this generation, but many to come. And my question, I just wrote down, I had to go get my pen because this always happens. I should keep my pen on myself. But what are you plugged into? What are you following? What are people seeing in your life? What do people see in your home? Moms and dads, if they see somebody coming in here praising God out here and then going home and, and raising any more do you know what at home? Your walk should match your talk. You've got to follow Jesus with passion. When you've when you got a team, you want people that are passionate about playing. And that's what God wants. And so let me move along because this is not a message. It will be. Yet when you live for God, look out. When your will is lined up with God's will for your life, there is no limit to the amount of love, joy, and fulfillment that you'll experience. And believe me on this too, it will spread like wildfire, or more appropriately said, Holy Spirit fire, like on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. When people see and perceive what God is doing in you and your family's life, they're going to start asking questions, especially if their life is struggling and in a wreck. Because we've all... We've all been there. We can all end up there due to the choices we make in every situation, in every circumstance. You will live, love, serve, and please God with such ferocity and fire it will inspire the same spirit to those people around you. Because when I talk about... Th and the reason, I, the reason I chose Tom Brady and I also thought of Ray Lewis when he comes out. And I mean, you ever see Ray Lewis watch the old tapes when he's like hitting a receiver? He's not only trying to knock the ball loose, he's trying to knock the guy's head off. Said it will inspire the same spirit to those people around you. Your spouse, your sons, your daughters, family, friends, brothers, sisters in Christ, so on and so on and even so on for generations to come that are not even born yet. I have another granddaughter coming up. July the 30th. Thank God for that. Guess what she's going to hear if, I, if God gives me the time? She's going to hear about Jesus. If she knows, then I'm called Sonny to them. If she knows Sonny, she's going to know the Son. No, there, there will be no question about that. There will be absolutely no... It's not even debatable. She's going to hear about Jesus. I don't care what anybody says. There is no limit. And that, my friend, is what scares the hell out of hell. That is what the enemy does not want to happen because when then he will start losing souls to heaven instead of us losing souls to hell. There is no limit to what God can do to a man who's fully on fire and fully committed and fully surrendered to God and the move of God in his or her life. You see, we've got to flip the script on Satan and his hordes by putting things in their proper order. And this is where we're going to finish it up at. Mark 12, 28 and 31. Now, when we, when, when we say this verse, a lot of people will say it because it's easy to, uh, re, to commit to memory. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love, the Lord, and love your neighbor yourself. This is your first and second greatest command. I'm like, there's no passion in that if I'm just running through it. No, this is how God gave it to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Everything. Your heart should be so filled with God that there's no room for anything else. Because then you can love your family with the proper love that is from the throne room of heaven. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with everything that's in you, all your being, passionately, not flippantly, not sleepily. I shared this with, with some people yesterday. I was like, I can tell the difference between preaching in jail and preaching in most churches is because these guys in jail, when I, when I was finishing up, like, well, let's say, let's get ready to pray and and without even me saying anything, they, 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 they locked arms. And they bowed over. And every one of those guys, the, all four pews was full, and they were locked over, bowed down with passion. 
Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Don't let anything get in your mind that's going to compete with your allegiance to God. Nothing. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. Everything that you do, every step I take, should be toward and for the glory of God. Every last conceivable possible ounce of everything you have belongs to God. Love your wife just as exactly like Christ loved the church and gave Himself unreservedly for it. Love with passion that Christ loved from the exhaust, inexhaustible, unlimited source which flows from the very throne room of Almighty God. Now with that attitude, after we pray, let us enter into His gates with thanksgiving and praises to the Lord our God with a shout of triumph over our foes. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then we're going we're gonna, to... I want you to worship God. I want you to worship God this morning. With, like, like there's no, there's nothing else. I, only want you, I want you focused on worshiping God and praying for PJ this morning because this is going to be a powerful, powerful day. And I believe if you receive what God wants you to receive, you're going to feel God move in your life. And this altar, there's no telling what will happen. It may blow up. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. And we pray that your power will come down from your throne room and that you would move in such a mighty way through this worship as we set our hearts and minds towards you that we can receive the engrafted word of God that's going to give us life, that you would speak through PJ this morning and that you would speak and open every heart, Lord, that we can receive and apply what God has given to PJ this morning. You speak through him, and if there's anything that's in the way, we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus, that things are going to flow so easily this morning that nothing can stop it. Lord, we love you so much, and thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to live for you today, to praise you, to worship you, and Lord, we love you. I pray that you'd anoint each and every person in here right now to receive what you have for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, Uplift. <laughs> well, what I thought we was heading is that uh, after Larry got done with the intro, we were just going to go ahead and di be dismissed for the day because of the way that he was heading with that. But, uh, but what, what is so awesome about that is that you see the passion behind that. And that was the whole point of his, uh, of his intro is the passion. And I want you to be encouraged this morning because sometimes we get the passion. Uh, other times we don't feel it. Uh, we say the same things uh, about say, life. Some days we're feeling it. We're having a great day at work. Things are going in our favor. Things are going good at school. You know, you're making good grades. But then one comment, you know, one speeding ticket or one flat tire or one person in the household putting back an empty milk jug in the refrigerator. And even though it's so frustrating, so many things can set us off. You know, we'd be so smooth sailing. And so when we get passionate, like there's days that we feel it and there's other days, you know, that we don't. And I think that's normal. But what I think Satan tries to tell us is, is that, no, you're the only one who feels that way. You're, you're the only one going through that. And, and those are lies. Uh, those are all lies. And that's why I love, I love, I say this series, but Jesus is, sermon series that he did on sermon on the mount and that's kind of what we're going through over these uh, three months and as big as a topic as it is and all the things that he talks about what amazes me is how intimate it is how personal it is and that's the key every time that we come to church our attitude should be okay lord what you got for me today my girls want to know this every Saturday. They really want to know it on Fridays, what is expected of them out of us and the farm on Saturday. So they want to know, what's the plan for tomorrow? What do, what do we got to do? They want to know the expectations. They want to know where they stand. And I think it's the same thing that we got to do. With every time we come to church, okay, God, what you got for me today? And maybe what Larry said, maybe it didn't catch with you. But maybe some of those worship songs did. Maybe what Larry said didn't connect with you. And maybe what the songs said didn't speak to you. But maybe the message will. Or maybe what Larry said didn't speak to you, nor the songs. 
nor the message, but it was a short little conversation you had when you came in that you had with somebody. Every time that we come, we should have an open mind, open heart, open ears. Okay, Lord, what you got for me today? Man, when we do that, man, it is powerful. And so each one of these subjects had personal meaning. It was so personal. Too many times we hear something, what the Bible says, or we'll hear a sermon preached, and we'll be like, oh, man, so-and-so needed to hear this. I've seen marriages do this all the time. Man, I wish my husband was here. Man, I wish my my wife was here. They need to hear this. I wish my kids was here. They needed this. But you're here, so guess who needs to hear it? You. You're the one who needs to hear it. I. I need to hear it. We all need to hear this. And so when he's speaking to this, it's like he's speaking to each individual person. And when we hear the preached word of God, we just need to make ourselves pretend like we're in our own little box our own little personal God box where he is speaking to you. Lord, what have you got for me today? Lord, speak to me today. One of my favorite prayers uh, that Super has prayed over the years is open our ears that we may hear what you'd have us to hear. Open our eyes that we may see what you'd have us to see. That's our prayer right now. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we can see what you'd have us to see. Open our ears so that we can hear what you'd have us to hear. That is my prayer for you this morning. Because what he shares is so intimate, it's so personal. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. And I think this is just so cool. Uh, Man, I just think this is so cool. Because it's so personal. This is for you here today. He was speaking to the crowds. But he was speaking directly to individual people. So in Matthew chapter 5, he gets and dives more into deeper into this message. And he's speaking to his disciples, but he's speaking to everybody. And he starts out in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. Now, we use salt all the time. And especially during this time, it was a special commodity. They would trade seasonings. We don't think about that. We just pick it up at Food Line, Food City, Walmart, order it off of Amazon. We just pick it up anywhere. And I love seasoning. One of my favorite things to do is to smoke meat. I, I love to smoke pork butts. Yesterday I smoked a mozzarella stuffed bacon wrapped meatloaf. It was so good. Man, it was so good. And uh, mac and cheese to go with it. But you put seasonings in with it. The seasoning. And people think that I have a special talent. I don't. I get the seasoning. And it makes me look really good. But the seasoning has a purpose. And we salt things all the time. And it has a purpose. Now salt is supposed to enhance the flavor that's already there. That's the purpose of salt. It enhances the flavor that's already there. So I want you to turn a person next to you and tell them something you salt. What is something you salt? Watermelon? You salt your meat for steak? What is something that you salt? Somebody said everything. Some of you people are crazy and you salt salt. We salt salt. This is where my father-in-law comes in. Okay, now, imagine this. If that salt had nothing in it, if it did nothing, what would it do? Well, in the words of Jesus, it said, well, it's no longer good for anything. It's no longer good for anything. So let's back up. Let's look how he made this personal. He said, you, you are the salt of the earth. You. He's speaking to you. And you may be here thinking, oh, well, he's speaking to so-and-so. Oh, he's speaking to the preacher. Oh, he's speaking to our youth pastor, Jason. Oh, he's speaking to Larry. Oh, he's speaking to Melly. No, he's speaking to you. You are the salt of the earth. And we love pointing out to everybody else, oh, I'm not the salt they are. No, there is no excuse. Everybody in here today, you are the salt. Now, he goes on to explain that we have a purpose. You have a purpose. You're the salt. And if we're not fulfilling our purpose, that's when we become tasteless. As he said, worthless. So what are we doing with our saltiness? What are we doing with it? Now, I sweat, especially when I'm working. And uh, <laughs> it's so funny because when I do, the, the salt comes out in, in your sweat. And uh, I'll, I'm going to say we're an affectionate family, but, you know, Amanda will kiss me or whatever. She's like, man, you need to go take a shower because the salt will be coming out. Why? 
because it's very distinct. You cannot deny it. We cannot deny what is inside of us. You cannot hide it. Whatever is in you is going to come out, good or bad. It's going to come out. We can put on a pretend show for everybody else, and we can be a bag of chips and all of that, but it's going to come out. Whatever is in you is going to come out. So you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. So you have a purpose. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. You have a purpose. Turn to the person next to you and tell them you have a purpose. Church, do you believe it this morning? See, some of you maybe feel like Larry's intro this morning and think like, I'm not feeling it. I don't feel like I have a purpose. I don't feel like I have a passion. I'm here out of obligation. I'm here because I just want to check a box. You have a purpose. And he defines this purpose. He defines the salt. Look at verse 14. He goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth. Now he says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. Not Larry. Larry is a light. But you are a light. You. Every one of us is a light. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. <laughs> what are you telling you? You cannot hide your light. People are going to see something in you. And it's so evident that you cannot deny it. You are a light. It will light. You are a light. Every one of us. You are a light. I'm a light. We're all a light. And he says it cannot be hidden. So when people look at you, they're going to see something. They're going to see some kind of light in you. Now he goes on to say it cannot be hidden. You cannot hide your light. What did it tell you about the salt? Something, whatever's in you is going to come out. They're going to see something in you. And you may be here today saying, I don't want people to be looking at me. I don't want people to be watching me. Parents, your kids are watching you. Grandparents, your kids are watching you. You go to work, people are going to be watching you. We talked about this last week. People are always watching. Always watching. So he says it cannot be hidden. I love verse 15. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. So here's, here's the stand. Okay? They put it on a stand. Why? For all the house, it gives light to all who are in the house to help them see. So he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. This verse is where we get the little kid's song. You know what I'm talking about? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We, we, we're not going to sing the whole thing because I'm not that good at it. But there's a part in this song that it says, hide it under a, <laughs> this is a bushel basket. That's what this is. It's a bushel basket. Now, my intention was, is I was going to lay this over top of it, but my flame is a little high, and I'm not going to do that this morning. Please note your fire extinguishers are located at the back. No. <laughs> we don't hide it. Imagine this. You're in a home that their only source of light is a candle or, or a lamp. So you light up for your house, said, okay, kids, time for supper. And you don't put it under a basket. No, you put it up high for everybody to see. We don't hide it. And I think oftentimes, this is the way that we're going around in our lives, carrying around a bushel basket, figuratively. No, not figuratively. We should be going around holding it a lot. Not trying to cover up who we are. Man, could you imagine? Maybe this is what you're struggling with. That you're trying to go through life hiding who you are, hiding who God created you to be. My favorite proverb is you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't hide who you are. He saved you to make you brand new, and He is creating in you a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
And so you don't have to hide who you are. We're supposed to let our light shine before men. What does he say? So they may see your what? Your good works. Your good works. And you may be here today thinking, what good works? I'm not that good. I think we're in light company. Paul goes on to say that even our very best is as filthy rags. So what makes us good? Here's what puts us all on the same page, church. Jesus. That's it. We are all on the same path to let a light shine before men so they can see what? Jesus. That's it. That's the key. That's the point is that others may see Jesus in you. Now, you may be here today and say, no, I don't want to be the light. You are. You cannot deny it. We are a light. We cannot hide that. So when people look at us, they're going to see something. What are they going to see? Just let them see Jesus. Let them see Jesus. And you may be here like, I don't want people looking at me, or I don't want people following me. They are. This is what is so unbelievable about the video that we watched, an I Am Second video, and that was of George Shin. George Shin came from nothing. Came from nothing. Uh, we often refer to people like that as a self-made millionaire or a self-made man. He has a net worth currently of $100 million. And to kind of put that in perspective, because it's hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around how much money that is, so to get $1 million, to get $1 million, just to understand, that means that you are earning $2,739.72 a day. Not a month, a day. And when you add all that up, it comes up, it's the closest I can get to in all my decimal points, but $999,997.80. And in this man who has accumulated all this wealth, he says the most important thing is my relationship with Jesus. And what Jesus is relating that to us today is with your light, your candle. Let your light shine before men. We have a privilege to let our light shine. Are we always going to let it shine bright? No. Are we always going to have the right things to say? No. But boy, we sure have it lit. So what do we do? What do we do with our lights? This means that when we go to work, when we go on vacation, when we're at the ball field with our kids, when we're at dance recital, when we're at the Walmart, we let our light shine. And church life is all about going through challenges to see how well we let our light shine. It's not about not having any issues. It's about letting your light shine through your issues, through your troubles, through your circumstances. So we are being a light. And this is such a big deal because of verse 17. He says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it's all accomplished. See, I love this because back then they thought that the only people that had to let their light shine were the religious people. If you read your Bibles in the New Testament, you're going to see them des- uh, described as scribes and Pharisees. Now, Pharisees were Levitical people is what they were, but to put it in layman's terms, what they did is they were the ones who interpreted the law. They were the ones who were supposed to live, be the most closest to God, the most spiritual beings. The scribes were like to it. They knew the word of God too, but they're called scribes because all they would do, they didn't have the printing press, so what they would do as scribes is that they would write down copies of the law, the law which is referred to as the Old Testament in your Bible. The scribes, when they would get down to the word Jehovah or one describing God, they would pause, go take a bath, and then come down and write down that word. And so in the people's eyes, the scribes and the Pharisees were the elite people. And so Jesus said, I came not to do away with all this, but to fulfill it. So instead of it being just these high elite people, they're not the lights. We all are the lights. 
Jesus was putting the responsibility to the people of God to be the light. They thought the elite were the only ones. He said, no, no, it's not this. He said, I came to fulfill this. So church, the crowd is us, and we have a responsibility. Jesus is saying that you are the light. It's not just the religious people. Don't leave it up to me. I'm going to do the best that I can. But it's hard for my one little candle to give light for all of you all. I mean, could you imagine how much light we would give off if we all had a candle? It would illuminate the room. Church, imagine if every one of us let our light shine before men. What kind of illumination that would do to the people around us. You're talking about setting a group on fire. It would set them on fire. So you have a responsibility to be the light. Now look at verse 19. He says, it's our responsibility, but whoever then annuls one of the least of these command, commandments and teaches others to do the same, he shall be called the least of the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. So he gives the conclusion here to the salt and the light that we're supposed to let our light shine before men. And what does that look like? You are teachers. You are an educator. We are supposed to be teaching people what it's like to live for Jesus. And if some of you are here today and like, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at teaching. That's great. We can show them. We can show them the way. How many times have somebody at work or your spouse or one of your kids ask you something you go, I can't describe it. I'm just going to show you. I, I'm in the computer tech support world, okay? And I try to help people with their computer issues. And back 20-some years ago, I worked at a computer store. And every now and then somebody would come in and buy a computer and then they would take it home and I would have to walk them through something or on the phone try to describe to them what to do. So I had a lady who came, was so excited. She was buying her first computer. She retired from Eastman and this was her first big purchase. She was going to quilt and use patterns off of the computer to help her with her quilting. She was so excited. She got home and she was unboxing her computer. She set up and she, she called. And she said, Patrick, I can't get my computer to work. I went, okay, what's going on with it? Well, the mouse thingy won't work. It doesn't work well. I can't control it. And I'm like, well, do you have it, you know, sit on your desk on the mouse pad like you're moving it? She said, no, I don't. It's in the floor. Well, why is it in the floor? Well, is it not like a sewing pedal? I'm like, no, honey, let's set that up on your desk. It's like, oh, it's great. What was we doing? Illuminating her way. We were teaching her the way in church. That's what it is with us and our walk with God is that we are sharing life with others. And you're going to be a, a different area in life than I am. And we can help each other along. In church, what's great about this, we can pray for each other. Your struggle, we can pray together. This is why it's so important for you to stay after church when we pray. It's an opportunity for you to share a prayer request and to pray with other people. So here in just a moment, we're going to be dismissed. You can go pick up your kids, and we're just going to come back, and usually about 10 till 12, we'll come together, and we'll just pray. We'll ask if anybody has a prayer request, or if anybody has something on their heart, or something that stood out from the day, and we just share some intimate times of, of prayer. Why? Because we're all trying to be a lot. And you're teaching people. And sometimes we need prayer to teach people. We are teaching others. You are teaching others what it's like to follow Jesus. Do not think that you're meant to get everything perfect. You're not. It's about who is leading us on this journey. That's why the 23rd Psalm means so much to me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rock and thy staff. I just love this because he's given the responsibility to all of us. The responsibility to all of us. You to be the light. Church, what this boils down to is if you will recognize this morning your responsibility to be the light. It's that simple. The second message of the Sermon on the Mount, the salt and the light. This morning will you recognize your responsibility to be the salt, to be the light. Some of you here this morning, you're like, man, I've already accepted this and I'm well on my way. That is fantastic. Keep teaching people. As you this morning, it's time for the river to meet the road. You need to take this serious. 
to get your family to church so that they can be encouraged not to hide their light under the bushel basket no but to be a light before all to be the light believe it or not school's getting ready to man it's getting ready to start back up and i already see the eye rolls from the kids like great don't be a lot at school teachers be the light the message this morning is very simple do you accept to be the light do you accept it so before you think no and declare that you can't live this that you shouldn't be the light it's somebody else's job it's not mine jesus has declared this morning that this is all our responsibility mine yours our responsibility so keep this in mind they thought the elite were the only people to be the light but look at verse 20 they were looking for the elite to be the light okay but he said in verse 20 for i say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses them you will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless it surpasses them so who then can be the light <laughs> anybody that's living for jesus when we get saved, we ask Jesus to save us. He comes and fills us up with his spirit. That's what's living inside of us. That's the light. And sometimes it gets diminished. Whether it be sin, whether it be addiction, whether it be a fight with the spouse, a job decision, a job loss man and we just kind of put this to the side sometimes we can get so far away so far away from god that we allow satan to blow out a lot now he's not removed our candle he's not removed jesus from us but we are so far down on ourselves we think that we cannot look up your responsibility this morning is to recognize that the only way you can be the light is through him that's it i know life's tough i know it's throwed you some curves i know that satan is your enemy but you're still breathing you're still here this means you still have a purpose this morning will you choose to let your light shine before men. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and that it's so real and relevant to us today. And right now, Father, we just pray that you would just speak to us right now as we come down for this life application part. This is our responsibility, what we're going to do with what's been preached, what's been said and done here today. What are we going to do with it? So we pray right now, Father, that you just speak to us as we respond to your word. As you continue to pray, so if someone ask you, do you accept this responsibility to be the light? This altar is open for anyone that feels led to come and pray. Now the reason why I love coming to the altar is that it signifies us coming before the presence of God, coming before His throne. And we get to claim to Him personally our response to His preached word. If the Lord is moving in your life to respond to today's service, the message, Larry's intro about passion, then I encourage you to come to this altar and just confess that to the Lord. Whatever it is that God is moving in your life to be the light, to be that salt. Church, do not listen to the devil. You are not worthless. You are not useless. You are exactly who God created you to be. All he wants you to do is to make it a point to be the light this morning that you would declare to be the light for your family, for your kids, for those you work with, for your community, to be the light. This morning, if the Lord is drawing you, then I encourage you to come to accept the responsibility to be that light. To be that light. Don't listen to Satan. He's a liar. And this morning, you have been challenged to be that light there's somebody to come to the altar and the lord is speaking to you then i encourage you to come come this is the greatest place to come there's no shame in this this is the place where we should come to
as those are on the altar and they're praying. You here today, maybe you don't feel led to come to the altar and pray, and that's fine. I encourage you right where you are to call, to call on Him, that you might respond to however He is leading you. But it is our goal that you would leave here today having known that you have fellowship with Him, knowing that not only are you going to be the light, but you would accept it from this day forward. If that's you today, then I encourage you right now just to take this moment to talk to the Lord. Right where you're sitting. And just communicate to Him what is on your heart about being the salt and the light. If the Lord is moving in your life, then I encourage you right now to pray. How is the Lord leading you? Maybe you're here today and the Lord is speaking in your life in a completely different way. Maybe this morning you need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. I'd love to have the opportunity to do that with you. If the Lord is speaking to you right now and that you need to be saved, I want you to do something bold and just come forward right here. I'll turn my mic off and we'll talk and we'll pray. And say, I need to be saved. If that's you today, then I encourage you to come. The lights are off. This is very intimate. It's just between you and God. How's the Lord speaking to you today? So maybe some of you here today, maybe there's just something going on in your life. Man, then I encourage you right now just to lift that up to the Lord. You got something going on in your life, then I encourage you right now. Usually I ask you to raise your hands up if you need prayer. But this morning, I'm just going to pray along with you. Okay, if you've got something going on in your life, then I encourage you right now, we're going to pray through this together. If something is going on right now in your life, then would you pray with me right now? Pray with me right now. Lord, I give you, and you fill in the blank. Lord, I give you such and such person. I give you this situation, whatever it is. Give the Lord the details right now in your prayer. Lord, I give you this situation, this person, this need. Speak, Lord, over this situation and let me know my role. Father, give me the words of wisdom to speak when I need to speak it and for the time when I need to be silent. Lord, touch my special situation and what's heavy upon my heart and the people that it affects. You know what's needed. Now may I be the light through my situation. That even though I may be struggling, people can see you in me. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much, God, that it's relevant to us here today. The Sermon on the Mount that was preached so long ago, and it's still so relevant. It's so clear. Father, use us. As we leave here today, as we go and as we are parents, wives, husbands, co-workers, employees, customers, help us, God, that people can see you in us. Father, forgive us for all of our many faults and failures. They are many. But thank you, God, for not being done with us yet. We ask, God, that you would anoint our actions and our words, that when we leave here today, all that we say and do will bring glory and honor to you. Thank you again, God, for what you're doing and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment to give God some praise? God, you're absolutely awesome.